if you're wondering why my hair is down for the first time in public, this is my uh, underground church pastor hair. I'm really letting my hair down. Thank you for the shaking of your heads. <laughs> um, a couple of things we want to celebrate. There's a lot that is happening and changing, and um, I think I forget how much is happening because I've been thinking about this stuff for months. But the first thing we want to do is celebrate some staff transitions. Um, is, is Geneva here? No? She's in the back. Well, when she comes up, we'll celebrate her. But she's stepping down from City Kids uh, leadership and paid staff, um, for one, because there's a lot less need, but for um, – for more probably organic reasons, she's served for a long time uh, out of sacrifice and out of need. And um, a couple months ago, we just said, man, what's next? And we just felt like it, we were at peace for like where we're going, going through the church that it would be time for her to, um, to be done and pursue other things. And she's been amazing. She was originally hired to be a support staff to another person. And for over a year and a half, maybe longer, maybe two years, <laughs> she has served as majority of the time as the lead, and she's done that out of love, and um, so we're super thankful for her, and if you get a chance, please thank her for all the hours of sacrifice and love and, and work she's done for helping us disciple our kids. So Geneva, and then Kylan McKeon, KMAC attack in the back, can you raise your hand? I want to say so many things right now, <laughs> um, but she's our media intern. She's going to be transitioning off as she graduates from USF um, in the next couple weeks, right? So she's done a ton of work to help support our Sundays, our Jesus Politics series, our podcast. She's putting together resources for how to utilize media and mission and outlet and service uh, for, for some of the applications of today. Um, so please thank her for uh, her work. She's been a huge support to our staff and a huge um, fun bringer. Um, fun size, bring in the fun, bring, bring in the fun. Um, so, uh, and then lastly, Nick Paulson. Raise your hand, Nick. Nicky P. Uh, he's not leaving quite yet. We got another month or so with him. But he's going off to seminary uh, to Princeton. Um, <laughs> that's, an, that's an Ivy League school. Um, we're super proud of him that he got into there, and uh, he's been such a support uh, to our worship, to our Sundays, and more than that, um, been functioned like an elder in many ways. And for for being so young, um, we just there's so many things that you show us about Jesus that we've appreciated having you around. So if you get a chance, make sure you thank him as well. All right, um, I think that's all the staff, and hopefully. Um, we can do some more things to celebrate you guys over the next uh, month or so. Um, the next announcement is, uh, even though we are no longer meeting as a larger gathering on Sundays, um, part of our passion and excitement is to provide uh, what we call outlets. Um, outlets is this third place. It's not a church. It's not somebody's home, but an outlet, a third safe place to engage with people that are either unchurched or dechurched or like don't want anything to do with the church and gives them a, a different setting to engage with uh, us on mission, us showing and sharing the gospel. And um, so we have a lot of things going on Sunday nights that can offer you guys not only a chance to, to be serving alongside some of the missions that are going on, but also some forms of worship. So if you could put the slides up. So the first Sunday of every month, our plan is a uh, holiday kind of pending to do taub worship. Uh, taub worship is basically a psalm immersive type of worship night where we go through all the themes of the psalms, you know, like thanksgiving, confession, laments, questions, pain, anger, and then we go through the promises of God, and then go, we go through petitions. And so it's uh, not only is it one part of our discipleship process and our huddles, but we try to do these immersive worship nights where we can worship together. We found that this is a very therapeutic uh, place for people that are uh, – wanting to grow and bringing their negative emotions to God and experiencing the healing and connection that comes <coughs> when most of us haven't experienced that. Um, so that'll be every first Sunday of the month, uh, location to be determined. Oh, good job. Nikki P. 
Oops. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to hammer through. Um, so please feel free to come. Our first one is tonight. Um, here. Uh, tonight it's here, and then uh, just stay connected to our, our social media. The next one is every second Sunday of the month, I'm a part of uh, what we call Worship Flow at my gym, AMT. It's free. I partner with Tasha Rose. You've maybe seen our outlet video uh, that we produced with Kylan's help. And that is this uh, combination of a musical worship experience with uh, embodiment and some meditative practices. And so I play music, I lead worship songs in between different um, flows of, of yoga, and uh, we practice and really do some beautiful things, uh, encountering God with, you know, last, last month was spring cleaning, so we spent time in three phases identifying lies that we believe, and identifying them, meditating on what the truth is, and um, worshiping through that. So I've found a lot of testimonies of people having a breakthrough because we hold a lot of negative emotions and experiences, traumas in our bodies, and when we can work those out, uh, there's some really cool healing. So that's Yoga Flow every second Sunday, and every third Sunday is Evolving Faith. It's also called Doubts and Deconstruction, but Evolving Faith Sioux Falls, we've started a community. There's about 60 of us online and about 25 that have gathered monthly, and it's a place to just process how your faith is changing. We have people that are on, on one side very conservative, e uh, evolving or deconstructing. We have some atheists and agnostics, and we're saying, hey, we're going to gather uh, in the middle and just say, we need community that's safe, that follows some rules of like confidentiality, of non-judgment, no agenda, and just be there for each other as we're all processing how much... Um, the faith community has changed. Even in the last five years, there's been a huge process of what, what people are calling deconstruction. So we want to provide a space for if any of you guys are going through that, if your faith is changing in any major way, if any life events or political events have kind of made you feel disoriented on where you are and what following Jesus looks like, it's a great way to, to form community and find a safe place. Um, and we have seen so many testimonies come just from doing this for a month and a half. So if you know anybody that's in that stage and they don't feel comfortable going to church or whatever, it's a great third place to, to, be, uh, to be family, to be gospel family, to, to love like Jesus would, um, and join us then. So every third Sunday. And every fourth Sunday, uh, we don't have a slide for, but there might be another opportunity. If you have an idea on what a unique uh, way to either gather together in service or in worship or some form of, of community where we can love each other and love our neighbor, um, let us know. We're going to be dreaming about that today. I think that's it for now. Yeah? Okay. Well, I want to intro our main content today. We're going to be watching a video on what underground church is. And there's lots of names for this. We've been using the term gospel community. You might hear me slip or use a synonymous phrase, microchurch. Um, but really what we're saying as a church proper, city church, and we've said this all along, but we're kind of going all in now, is we're saying that actually our gospel communities is our primary and what we believe to be a full expression of what doing church is. And we're going to talk about it in the video, but this has always been a part of our DNA as a church. It's what we started doing for the first six months. And we have just found that um, for us to, to follow the unique call that we have, we are going to go all into the microchurch model. Um, you might be asking why, um, but I think, was it 2018 when we started meeting? We, was it 17? Yeah, so we, we got together, a couple, couple families of us, and I'd always felt called to plant a church towards the D church, towards millennials. And we've seen this huge departure of people in the millennial generation leaving the church. And we said, hey, um, what's the most effective way to, to reach them? And I think at that point, we were thinking, let's get them back here, you know. And how do we do that? And we started listening to some of the problems they had, some of the wounds they had, some of the reasons they had. And we said, okay, now that we know what they've experienced, in their church church life, we want to start a new expression to maybe meet some of those needs, address some of those wounds, and present what we believe would be a life-changing way of living, which is having a relationship with Jesus. So we started City Church, uh, I don't know, 
be four years ago in August when we started having conversations at Core Team. And we found in our research that um, missional communities, which is another word of microchurch movement, is that if we do church differently, if we embody it differently in the community, um, it, it might actually be more effective to, to be Jesus and to be the community of Jesus to the millennials that uh, we felt a call to, to love and serve and share Jesus with. And the stats showed that um, if we did uh, a microchurch type of uh, setting, that a lot of the issues and, and hurts and wounds and uh, kind of experienced hypocrisy of the church, that this would be a more fertile ground to have conversations about Jesus and to live into uh, what following Jesus looks like. But when we started the plant, we said, well, we'll do that for the first six months. And, but then because we're in Sioux Falls and because we need to grow at a certain rate, we, we still need to do and meet people's needs on a Sunday traditional gathering. And so for the first six months of City Church, we just did microchurch stuff. We just did gospel communities, missional communities. We're like, what does this look like? Strip church down. What is the essence and the basics of following Jesus? And we did discipleship, and it was amazing. Like, it was probably the, m the most fun we had in this journey so far. The first six months were uh, just amazing. We're all relearning what it meant to, to follow Jesus and to know God, to know what the gospel was. But we felt like to meet some of our goals and to meet the needs of Sioux Falls and to be a healthier, more sustainable mega church, we needed to do the Sunday thing. So six months after we started, we started preparing a Sunday launch team. And we did that for a year. We formed teams. We did hospitality. We did city kids. We, we did all the things that the traditional model um, suggests and says this is effective. But as we did that, we realized um, not only was it a ton of work and a ton of energy, um, but the payoff wasn't there. The reward, the results, the if you looked at cost-benefit analysis to use business terms, it was costing us a ton of energy and time and staff hours and, no joke, like headache. Because it was a program. And our heart was to do the program to meet the need and try to be accessible, to meet people in the middle. But what we realized was uh, we stopped living into, at least as much, living into the unique call that we had to do church simpler, to do church more missionally, more serving. And so we kind of felt split after those first six months. Uh, we, we are thankful for the people that God brought us in the midst of doing Sunday church. I think we added like 15, 20 people, and they're amazing people. Um, we're like, yeah, they're totally worth it. But as we looked at it uh, about a year and a half ago, and this was about a year after we started doing Sunday stuff, we had a leadership meeting, and it was November. Some of you were there and a year and a half ago, and we said, something's got to change. Uh, we're tired. Uh, both Luke and I were spent. Both of us were considering quitting. And we just said, something's got to change. We love this church. We love all the testimonies of, of breakthrough, but something's got to change. And so we prayerfully spent a weekend as a leadership team saying, where is God at work, and how do we – reform our structure on that. And what we found was the 80-20 principle in full effect. Can you pull up that 80-20 chart, Kylene? I love this. We found this on Google. Saved us a ton of time. But we found that 80% of our effort was going to Sunday, and it was pr providing about 20% of the results. And then after the first six months of focusing on, on microchurch, gospel community, whatever you want to call it, House church, we used a lot of words. 20% of our energy was going to that, kind of the scraps. But yet it was producing 80% of the results. And so a year and a half ago, we said, all right, 2020, we're going to just go for it. And every, it was this sense of, like, this is risky, like, this doesn't work. But, man, you can't, you can't debate this. So what if we, instead of, like, doing the 80-20 thing where we're just churning all this energy for 20% of the results, what if we flipped it and structured our church to actually benefit where we're seeing the results? And so we said 2020. We're going to meet twice a week on Sundays. It's going to be. Yes, we did. Like, yeah, 2020. And I think our phrase was, we're going to really live into the experiment of, yeah, the 2020 vision. We got, we know what we're doing. 
And we watched the same video we're going to watch today, and there was this buzz, like, yeah, we could do this. This is awesome. Like, it, get, get, it got rid of all the stressful things, and it, it helped us live into um, what we originally felt called to do, and we're so excited, and we're two months into our, in, into our vision, and then COVID hits. And then we start spiraling, and we're like, man, like, how do we, how do, we do this? Even though we weren't relying on the Sunday, still uh, probably half of our church needed that. And it was an important part of their spiritual rhythm. And so we kind of started spinning of like, well, let's pivot. we got to pivot to meet people's needs. And so we said, oh, so people need the Sunday tradition of things. Something about trauma, something about crisis makes us return to our, like, nostalgic things. So we just we kept trying to change things to meet people's needs. And as you have all known, that's been impossible with COVID. Our needs have changed. Our perception of our needs have changed. We, like, fought over... You know, the seriousness of COVID, our comfort levels of COVID, that's our responsibility. It was a stressful year. But all the while, for the most part, uh, gospel communities or micro churches were at minimum surviving and, and for some of them pretty dang healthy. Even though most of the church in the world wasn't meeting in gatherings on Sundays, our church expression in those groups for the first six months of COVID, was like 95% attendance. But as time went by, some of our missional elements dropped, and some of the, the fatigue of COVID kind of strained some of, our, some of those groups. And um, so it's been a year now, and it's been a year since COVID. And now in this phase of church planning, we are now looking at, like, as we look at what sustainability looks like, as we look at what health is, we look at what's working and what's not and how hard it's been and what's been good, we've said uh, some things need to change again. And we served our community by doing every Sunday for the last two or three months based on a need that we heard, hey, we just need to gather again. And though that servi those services were amazing and that series was so much fun and we had a ton of engagement with our community, uh, we realized this is no longer sustainable on a financial standpoint. Uh, because of where we're at in the church plant phase and outside partnership. Financial standpoint, because since COVID, our giving has mostly been cut in half. Um, from a, uh, what was the other standpoint? Um, just from the fruit of our labor standpoint, again, Sundays have been great, but not worth all of the energy that we've poured into. And on top of that, um, 15 members of our core group at City Church, a lot of which are very contributing people, uh, they're moving out of state. So like one thing after another after another, we're like some, we got to do something different. And um, now that we're all falling from COVID, it's time to say what's next and what can living into our strengths, into energy giving activities look like. And so we're going underground and we're going to put 80% like we said we were going to do we're going to shift 80% of our staff energy and money and creative strategies and coaching into micro churches, gospel communities, into being more missional and organic and out there. We're going to pull the plug. We're going to we're going to pull the cord. Or I don't know what the phrase is. We're going to cut the cord. Thank you. I don't know why I said thank you. You're you're like the right side of my brain. So like I'm looking for you. Um, we're going to cut the cord, and uh, we're going to go for it. And we're going to say, God, like, this is, this, these are our five loaves and two fish, and we're going to give all our heart and time and energy to, to this instead of the strain that Sundays has been to try to figure out what's needed, what works. Um, so that's how we got here. And so what we realized and what's been encouraging in the midst of doing this kind of church is that some, some, sometimes this feels like, like, you know, is this crazy? Is this a good idea? Um, it sounds cool, but does it actually work? Um, and so we've been super encouraged by the fact that this is a, a worldwide movement. It's called the underground movement or micro church movement, house church movement. Um, and actually, it's not a new thing. It's a, it's a res restoration of how the church started 2,000 years ago. And um, we re we've been super encouraged by an organization in Tampa Bay called the Tampa Bay Underground. And we're going to watch a documentary on what this has looked like in Tampa Bay, what this has looked like in America, and really give, uh, give a presentation on how this is not only doable, um, but life-transforming. So 
roll the footage, Kylan. My name is PJ Sotero, and I'm a filmmaker. I've been a part of and told stories for some of the world's biggest churches, but I've never come across anything quite like the Underground Network. Ten years ago, it was a group of people in a living room, and now they have hundreds of microchurches across six continents. So who are they, and what do they do? Never been to a correctional facility in my life, but I had a calling to go in there and see for myself the type of ladies that society has branded as rejects. We serve women who have been sexually exploited. We go to strip clubs in our city. We go to brothels in our city. There wasn't a specific burning in my heart to work with people in this neighborhood, but it was what was right in front of me. We do group mentoring, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and our goal is to empower them in their ethnic identity and in their relationship with Jesus. We take garbage and we use that waste and we convert it into energy to reach the community. So how would you describe the Underground Network? That is such a hard question. Oh, dang, how you answer that question. Sorry. <laughs> Let me think of it this way. Like when you're Sorry. <laughs> that's a tough one. That's a tough one because it's so multifaceted. It's it's not supposed to be a funny question. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It turned out to be a lot harder to define <laughs> than expected, and it's the question that I try and answer over the length of this documentary. The first step to understanding the underground is to start at the beginning and look at the elements that were in play to understand why the typical church model wasn't enough. 15 years ago, there was a group of over 50 college students who were a part of a campus ministry called Inner Varsity. We were um, doing mission. We were surrendering our lives to Jesus each day. We were doing Bible studies. We were winning our campus. Being a part of a community on campus that was trying to bring the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven was this time of risk and adventure and um, dreaming. And going from that to a space where you were really only in challenged to think about the kingdom of God on a Sunday morning and really the kingdom of God just being the church itself, the building, the program, just felt it was a disappointment left me feeling empty. One core problem existed at that time, which was, what do we do when we transition out of college? The inner varsity experience uh, with, with God and the, inner, and the experience that we had with the mainline church was drastically different. On campus, honestly, we were experiencing this sort of potent form of church that when I would go sit on Sunday morning and try to worship and listen to a sermon, it began to just come up short. And it just felt like there has to be more to following Jesus in the world than this. And then when there's times of like, well, I wanna get invested. I wanna, I wanna try to do something. I wanna use my giftings. And the only options that were available were singing on the worship team, um, kids ministry, or women's ministry. And I just thought there had to be more. Like, God is doing something more in me, and they do not fit in the parameters of these three options. Is there anything else? And there wasn't. And I think that was the moment where I realized, like, I think we need to leave. I mean, these people have been amazing leaders on campus. Evangelist leaders, they've gone overseas. They're amazing. They're trained, you know, equipped, experienced. And they're told, I need you to sit in a pew, and I need you to give money. And maybe you could do the parking ministry or whatever, something like that. And that just really upset us. I mean, just over time, it just every week, it was just this. We just come back from Sunday services and go, this is not what we see in Scripture. This makes no sense with our lives and what we're experiencing as missionaries. You know, we're seeing 
churches on every corner, every street, and nothing is being changed. The, the things that are happening in the world is not being addressed. So there was a group of us that felt the same way. I wasn't the only one. I wasn't the only one that was trying. I just went to people that I knew were sort of disaffected with their current churches, either weren't going anymore or were, or were just always upset. And I just said, what if we just did something different? Um, I don't really know what it is or what it should be, but I want to give my life, the rest of my life, to figuring that out. Do you want to come with me? We struggled with uh, whether we wanted to uh, challenge the church or become the church on our own. That is, whether even before starting something, we attempted to do something different, which was we were going to work with the church and we were going to try to change our things from the inside out, and we realized how difficult that was, how difficult it could be to change culture uh, at large. And so we decided to group together and seek the Lord and try to figure out what those things were. And so there are many different things that are on the table, things that we, we felt that needed to be addressed and things that we wanted to not just be about, but to live through our values. So for instance, uh, our value for the poor, right? So, you know, one of the questions that we asked at the time was, um, do we want to be a church of the poor? You know, do we want to be a church for the poor? You know, like how far are we, are we willing to take this? Why are we operating in a system we don't believe in? And that's really the birth of the underground is that realization. It's to say, okay, wait, we don't have to just complain about this other system. Let's just be what we think is right. Let's be what the church is. And I'm going to tell you, that, 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 is, that is good and liberating for the person, the soul, because you can let go of critique. You can act, I actually think you can, we begin to embrace a fellowship of the larger church in a deeper way because we felt free or permission to be the church in the way we thought we could be. But the problem is we didn't really know what that meant. The intention of being in Manila was really to steal away, to, to put ourselves in an environment where we could, we could escape our cognitive prisons, where we could see the world in a broader, greater sense, and we could encounter God in a new way. At first, we were surprised why they wanted to come here. But then, it was also an honor uh, because they wanted to, to to know about our culture and what we do among the urban poor. We focus on uh, establishing house churches and uh, we were able to establish more than 100 house churches. So during the day we would work with these Filipino missionary agencies. and submitted ourselves to those Filipino leaders. You know, teach us, teach us about God, teach us about community, teach us about prayer, teach us about mission, teach us about evangelism, teach us, we're just, everything is open for discussion at this point. Pour into us, we're open. Uh, for many of us, we have that little a shock of, well, what is this? What does it mean to be amongst the poor in this way? Seeing a church uh, of the poor, loving the poor, not ignoring the poor. I mean, the experience was, unlike anything I've experienced before, I feel like the way that I see the world is definitely through a totally different lens. Uh, it was radical. I saw ways of following Jesus into the darkness that I had never seen before. When the group left to go to the Philippines, it really forced a lot of us to step out because they were no longer there. Brian wasn't there, Jeremy wasn't there, a lot of these people who were leading us through InterVarsity and was kind of leading the structure and the movement and our time was now in a different country, in different time zones, far away. And so a lot of us had to uh, not default to their leadership anymore, but actually lead. And I think it was a really great moment for us, um, for them to get out of the way and let uh, these emerging leaders kind of rise up to the surface. We were, we were learning, we were being servants in a missionary field which is foreign to us. and just trying to be and live and incarnate among the poor, the very poor, living among them. And then at night we would steal away and we would try to write, to, to design this new thing, which we knew was in our hearts, which needed to be articulated somehow. 
For the next nine months, the team and their families lived in Manila and designed the structure of what would become the underground. At its heart was a manifesto of values that would become the glue for this diverse missional community. This has served as a guide for the last 10 years of their work here in the States. When we got back from that, that experience, that's when we kind of officially launched this thing called the underground. There wasn't anything we were doing in our mission and our approach and our community and our worship, which we didn't believe in. That's a powerful thing. And so a lot of our, our initial microchurches came out of that need, you know, seeing uh, women in prostitution right down the street, you know, begat things like created um, or the Timothy Initiative with addiction, you know, but then also ideas of like, well, we live in a neighborhood with, uh, with black youth, how can we help that? And so those things kind of begat things like Mama Africana or missionary mentors. But then there were other things that we realized that were possible that we didn't even know that were a thing. Uh, when we began to feel the edges of that and realize, man, some of these things are more than just our, our proximity to the people around us, but just also who we are and what God has created us to be. You know, some of the people I led house church with now lead ministries towards uh, for uh, involving foster parenting and foster kids because that was something that they had a, a, a burden for. I want to introduce you to a few different microchurches. No two of them look the same, and some are just starting. Some have been around for 10 years, but they all share a common mission of reaching the margins with the love of Jesus. The ministry that I'm a part of and have a privilege to serve in is called Honor One. Um, Honor One is God's heart through Asian people, trying to reconcile our culture with Christianity and reach out to our people. Currently, we have this model where Thursday nights we meet up as a core, as a family. And family night is all about food, <laughs> essentially, food and Jesus. Um, we gather um, on Thursday nights to celebrate one another, hear, hear each other's stories, and then we have Bible study. One of the main focal reasons why we meet up on Thursdays is because we're a collection of brothers and sisters that are part of all different churches, communities here in the Tampa Bay area. And what's holding us together is our missional heart, which is to reach out. And so what we do then is every Friday, we do an outreach. When you go out and serve our friends in the street, we, we bring these non-Christians with us. And they love, they love that servanthood. They love uh, learning from our friends, our brothers and sisters on the street. And in that moment, that space of vulnerability, two things happens, it allows the Holy Spirit to move within the community, but also allows us an opportunity to share their heart and why we do it. It's very simple, but um, it's very community orientated um, because we know the gospel is best um, when it's done in the nexus of community. It was important for me to start Mama Africana because I really felt like the Lord was telling me to do so. I'm realizing that the Lord had already prepared me for this even when I was like younger um, with my experience as a black girl um, growing up in Boston and different times that my self-esteem was really low because I was bullied because we didn't have much because you know I was disregarded you know as a black girl. We're able to relate to these girls in a level that not, not a lot of people can. So when we started, it was five girls and four mentors. And we just basically got the girls kind of like within our like, um, <laughs> like neighborhood and um, women from like that I'm close to. Like we just all got together and we're like, let's just mentor these girls. We have the time to do it, let's do it. Yeah, so we, we went from just serving middle school girls then to high school and now elementary. And it is such an honor to join Jesus um, on this mission to serve the black girls of Tampa. All Kindred is is a reflection of that past. It's an idea of what, for me, what it means to be pastoral. And that's my particular gifting, is to open my home, to be hospitable, and to show people the reality of Jesus as it ex is expressed in my family. And so really, that's all Kindred is. It's, you know, my door's open, come in, we cooked. Let's talk about Jesus. 
and uh, we've kept that simple model. And you know, I have committed to then in turn uh, pouring in as much as I can to the people that come there, uh, as a mentor, as a as a disciple maker. Because uh, the intention for Kindred is, you know, and this is a secret to the people in Kindred, but I don't want them to stay there forever. I want them to leave and start something else somewhere else. And not another Kindred, but to start a thing that God has called them to do. So some of our people are already engaged in mission. And so for those people, maybe it's more simple and Kindred represents a place of rest. But for some people, they're still trying to figure that thing out. I think that Kindred is a place where people can encounter Jesus in a way that postures them towards saying, listen, this is awesome. What else could I be doing? And to be able to do that, to feel supported by the group that is able to now send you and bless you and then support you after that as well. Um, at age 14, I had got in trouble and sold drugs to an undercover cop and that's when I started my addiction. It really got out of hand in, in 2008. I actually had overdosed. Um, uh, the doctors actually had told my family I would not make it. Um, I was in a coma. They said if I did make it, I was actually going to be in a vegetable state of mind. And I remember actually my daughter, they, they, she came into the room and whispered in my ear, Daddy, I need you. Um, so I snapped out of it after about another month and a half of uh, learning how to walk and write again. And my name and who I was. Um, I thought that was it. I thought, okay, finally, I'm going to stop. And uh, it wasn't a matter of three or five days. Uh, I wound up picking up and using again. That was the last time I lived with my daughter. I lost my daughter in 2012 to the state of Florida. Really, really hit a rock bottom. Picked up where I left off probably times seven. Wound up getting incarcerated again. May of 2015 is when I came to the Timothy Initiative. The Timothy Initiative have been, has been different for me because it's actually, it, it's a lifestyle radical community where it, it, it's, it's open-ended where there's no time, time limit on it. So it's not like I'm in a rehab facility where I got six months and then I got to figure out where I got to go. I'm actually in a community around like-minded individuals that I know have full accountability and I'm going to live the rest of my life with these men. And following Jesus is, is the key factor. I would say in the Timothy Initiative. It's, it's been such a beautiful experience for me. I've been sober for two years now. I am actually now the recovery director of the Timothy Initiative. I mentor men. I uh, walk them through the, the steps. Um, I teach classes. I have one-on-ones with them. Um, <laughs> me and my daughter, since, since op uh, op uh, coming to the Timothy Initiative, we have uh, reconciled. <laughs> I've been seeing my daughter daily on the weekend um, for the past two years now. One evening I had, I had came home and uh, realized that the house that we were working on and, and getting renovated, um, all the guys were there working. And, and I was like, wow, like, what are we getting this done for? And uh, only to be surprised that this is actually the house that, that me and my daughter are gonna be living in and, and she's gonna be growing up in. And they threw me not only the biggest housewarming party but all the leaders in, in the underground community were there to welcome my daughter and to let her know that there, there, there's children her age in the community and, and, and there, there's kids there that she could play with and I, I'm finally gonna be able to be the father that, that, that I was supposed to be. Um, and now my daughter's actually gonna experience Jesus and, and see the miracle that Jesus has done in, in her father's life. And, and what, I, what I want is just to keep moving forward, man, and, and just share the strength and the hope that I have, that, that I got, and the knowledge of following Jesus with the new guy that's just walking into the room. One of the most interesting things that I've learned about the underground is that in the 200 plus micro churches in Tampa, 130 of them are based in predominantly poor communities. And though the majority of the underground is made up of middle class, many of them voluntarily live in low income neighborhoods. This stands in stark contrast with the suburban church lifestyle that I grew up with. I believe it's one of the key reasons and why they're able to find and impact marginalized communities so well. The underground builds bridges between the middle class and the poor. John Dangler is someone who's been a part of the underground since the beginning 10 years ago. He started the well, which exists to serve the different needs of the poor. Not surprisingly, they serve food to those who live on the streets, 
but they also try and serve other needs of the community, like the need to be seen and heard through an open mic night, a drop-in center to get clothes, food, and a shower. And most recently, they've opened a bike shop to provide work and solve transportation issues. The earn a bike program is a way to work for and, and earn the transportation that you need to get access to the rest of the city. Because I live on the street and I have a bicycle that I have to repair and fix all the time. And it's, it's good that I know what I'm doing and to help other people learn how to work on their own bicycle and to fix their own bicycle if they want to learn. Our vision really is to see bridges built between the rich and the poor, between resources and lack of resources, where we can be a healthier, more holistic city across economic and racial barriers and lines like that. It's not just the microchurches that are innovative. The way the underground has designed their facility is also extremely unique. Instead of a building revolving around a worship center, their building is centered on a co-work space. This encourages innovation and collaboration, conference rooms, event space, financial services, media support, coaching and trainings are also provided to the micro churches. There's even a space called the dream room with whiteboards where people can test out ideas for future micro churches. They call this building the hub and it feels like a Silicon Valley tech incubator rather than a church building. The underground does have a Sunday service, but it's not mandatory. They call it a weekly conference for missionaries rather than the centerpiece of the church. I was surprised to find out that less than 50% of their microchurches actually show up on Sunday mornings. Some even attend other church services. As diverse as these leaders in their work is, the one thing that they all seem to have in common is the courage to start something. For Derek, it just started by going into a bar. Me and another guy that were going decided we were going to join a flag football team to just meet people and then invite them back to Bible study. And after doing a season or two of that, we were inviting the guys, inviting the team, and nobody was coming to Bible study. So I was like, is it just me, or is it the Bible study that they don't want to hang out with? Let's figure this out. So got the idea to let's go to a pub afterwards, go to a bar, and just have a beer um, with the team. And when I invited them to that, more than half the team came out. So it was really cool to, to realize that it wasn't me that they didn't want to hang out with. It was just maybe the home church setting that they weren't comfortable with. What we ended up creating was like a safe third place for people to go. It's not at a church and it's not at somebody's house that they don't know. It's at a bar. It's at a local drinking establishment that they've been to, they frequent. They're going there. People are going to bars in general to find community. And it just grew and blossomed into this thing where I needed to put more attention to it. I couldn't just have it on the side as an outreach anymore. And uh, we kind of stepped away from, from mobile and just started Beer and Bible as its own uh, micro church. Each of these 200 microchurches has a beautiful and compelling story to tell. I was only able to interview a few, and I was overwhelmed by their faith, commitment, and courage. Here are just a few examples, snapshots into what I saw. Abba House is a safe haven for women in transition. We provide housing and a structured program to assist our ladies to live independently. Created serves women who have been sexually exploited through addiction, prostitution, and trafficking. Created goes to strip clubs and brothels to build relationships with women and invites them back to their residence and recovery program, which has seen countless women restored over the last 10 years. After fostering over a dozen kids, we partnered with others in our community to start Grounded to help connect those who are involved in the system of foster care. We have monthly respite events and try to bridge the gap between foster care and everyday life. Heart Dance Foundation reaches women, men, and their children involved in the adult entertainment industry. They've made tremendous breakthroughs in Florida legislation and advocacy on issues of addiction and the labor and sexual exploitation of human trafficking. One of the major aspects of the JUST initiative is that we run a residential program that's for women and children that are facing homelessness. Impact Global International leads a recycling movement in Haiti which converts waste into energy. Their vision is to partner with the community and local government to transform waste into biofuel to power Haitian neighborhoods. Justice Restoration Center and Advocates Against Human Trafficking serve victims and survivors of human trafficking in a context of faith, 
hope, and love. Advocates Against Human Trafficking coordinates safe prison releases for trafficked inmates, along with one-on-one -on -one survivor mentorship and financial support. And Justice Restoration Center provides trafficked women, men, and children with free trauma-informed restorative legal services and anti-trafficking legislative and policy advocacy. And these are just a few of the stories that I was able to tell. When you step back and look at the whole, it really makes you reevaluate everything you know about how the church is supposed to work. I think if people knew that there was another way to do church, that it didn't have to revolve around being entertained on Sunday mornings, that it could just center on being Jesus to the margins and a community that you're called to, then it would radically change the Western church and the impact that we had on the world. So the question comes, how? How might the church change to better empower people to mission? I really like Brian's insight to this question. Please, 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 I beg you, don't waste your time and energy trying to change that church. Become the church. And that means starting with mission. We still think, we still think that we plant churches by starting worship services, by inviting people to a worship service. This is not fundamentally what the church is. A worship service is, is a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's an important thing. It can be something that's full of life and vitality and the delivery of the, the word of God, the voice of God to a community, but only if they are vibrant with mission first. So what I would say is if you want to change your church, you want to be a part of engineering some kind of change in your church, extract yourself from it, from its politic, from its expectations, Find a place where non-believers are, where needy people are, where those who are hungry for the kingdom and don't know it are. Get a team of people, root yourself there, and see the kingdom come. If you do that, and people come to Jesus, well then you're gonna have to baptize them. You have to disciple them. You're gonna have to meet real serious needs. And you will become as a peripheral entity, an alternative to the existing church. Win them by doing the thing we believe in. Don't, don't try to have meetings and committees and change age-old bylaws or something. Live the thing we want to see. I think this is the fundamental flaw which plagues most churches, is that it starts with structure rather than starting with community, with a people group to serve. But I don't want to focus on the problems of the Western Church, because I think it's easy to point the finger and not do anything about it. The real question is, what can we do about it? Do one small thing. With, with really no uh, concern for what happens afterwards. And, and just find Jesus in that faithfulness, that small, ordinary, simple faithfulness. And what, hap what happens afterwards is really up to him. I mean, in the simplest form, I, what I did was I took something that I enjoy doing. I enjoy drinking beer. And I brought Jesus into that. It's not that difficult. It could be playing cornhole. It could be playing basketball. It could be going, doing something that other people, that you enjoy yourself, that other people also enjoy, and then bringing Jesus into that space. It's, it's good to have a community that understands what you're going through and it's kind of like a crutch, like, hey man, we have you, we got you, keep going, don't stop. And if you ever thought about quitting, they won't let you, you know, and I just think that's um, really important to have that kind of community. But what is that one thing that when you see it, it breaks your heart over and over and over again? And then just ask Jesus to walk with you in that process. That there are constant kingdom building opportunities that we miss. And being bivocational just means we've got unique opportunities that missionaries that are going to different countries or different places won't have because they're not called to those places. But I am. I work at this building and this office. You know, that's my mission field. Where I live is my mission field. You know, where I play basketball is my mission field. So everything, every single thing that I'm doing is an opportunity. I think if someone feels a call from, from God 
uh, any call at all, I believe they should, they should act on it. They should do something. Uh, they don't have to be part of the underground in order to do that. They just have to know Jesus. And if he's calling you to do something as an empowered Christian, then get out and do it. I think way too much people spend time on waiting and waiting and waiting, and then it never happens. And God is calling us to do something that day, the day he speaks to you, to get up and be active. Do it. I'd like to end this with the same question that I set out to answer at the start. What is the underground? I think about places in the world. I think about places in the in the Arab world, for example, where people there's no one there's no one really living as the church and in, in, in community and, and as a witness to the gospel. And so God just appears to people in dreams. Jesus just appears to them in their dreams, and then they meet each other. They meet each other and they say, "I had this dream about this man, Jesus, who came to me." And they say, "So did I have the same dream." And that happens to me all the time. I mean, almost everywhere I go, when we tell this, this story, people say, I had that same dream. I had that same dream. And something happens to us, like some sort of, some sort of family is forged and fraternity exists in that dream, the place that we um, share, like our deepest desires, our longings to see the kingdom come and, and almost like prophetically expecting it to come in a certain way. We're not the only people dreaming this dream. And more and more, I'm finding this family of people who say, I mean, almost verbatim, they say, those are my ideas. That's what I've been wanting to do. That's what I've been dreaming of. So maybe we're Netscape. Maybe we're the first to market. Maybe we're the first to, to sort of, I don't know, blaze some trail. But, but it would be okay with me if nobody ever remembers that. As long as, as long as the church itself is allowed to be free and become what it is that God wants it to be in our time, in our generation. They can forget our name, and in the end, that's maybe why we chose such a shy name, because it isn't, it isn't and it cannot be about one ego or one logo. It has to be about the kingdom itself. And that's part of the dream that we share. You know, every time someone says, this is what the underground is, I can point to a bunch of other things that, oh, that's, that's included too. Oh, well, you know what, that, that's included too. Like, I feel like the one thing that is so unique is like, everybody's doing something different. We all have some little, little puzzle piece that helps make up um, you know, what Jesus is actually doing in Tampa and beyond. There's like this paradox of like, we're doing different things, but we're also doing it like as a big family um, of believers who feel like the church can be more than what it has been. One of the most beautiful thing is each individual that you'll talk to, you hear a dream. It's just a nice place to actually feel empowered. Yeah, to me, the underground is a place of possibility. The underground is is a collection of dreams. That cheerleader that you have in your corner. The closest thing I have ever tasted to the priesthood of all believers. A multi-ethnic missional movement that encourages and empowers leaders to pursue their God-given call to impact this world. Maybe it's a fool's errand to try to draw a dotted line around what the underground is. You know, the underground is an idea. And once you have the idea, you're part of it. Check one, check one. Hey, let me turn those lights up. So pretty inspiring, right? Um, I feel so official sitting on a, uh, yeah, it's pretty questionable. Yeah, I'm just gonna just ignore the chair. Um, so 
right away, I, I wanted to take it from this inspiring thing in Tampa to like what it's looked like in Sioux Falls. The great part about this is that we're not starting from scratch. Actually, we've been using some of these principles from the beginning. And so I have Rachel up here to share. Uh, the funny thing about Rachel is uh, when, when COVID happened, they naturally became a microchurch and autonomous. And the ironic part is they're like, we, we're good. Like, we don't need anything. Every other gospel community, microchurch, whatever you want to call it, was like, we need this, we need that. And every time from Luke and Rachel, actually, we got this. We're good. And so the funny part is, is we kept trying to figure out, well, how do we serve a group like Rachel's if they don't need anything or, like, don't know what they need? So we, the irony is now a year later, they've been doing this pretty much without, I mean, other than some discipleship and coaching, uh, they've been doing this. So I wanted her to share a testimony of what this has looked like, why this is worth it, why in, in many ways it's been better for you guys to not have the Sunday gathering. So go for it. Hello. Okay. Um, yeah, so part of that, uh, what Daniel was saying, we got a lot of mentorship from him uh, and discipleship from him. So credit to you. To <laughs> yeah, you guys that. got a lot of training. Even when we started, you went to everything with us. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so that kind of cast like the vision for Luke and I. Um, and so the way that our group actually started was uh, from our gym, and it was a place that we had already been building relationships with people, you know, over years. And so we kind of just said, like, hey, here's a couple people we actually have in mind, and we invited them to come over to our house, and we you know, shared food, had dinner, whatever. Uh, and, and over, I don't know, it was probably like a year and a half, we kind of just started adding more people. Some were from the gym, some were from just from City Church, um, or you know, just random connections. Um, after COVID, or I guess during COVID, um, when everyone kind of just stopped going to church, uh, that I guess that were a part of churches, uh, we decided as a group that we still wanted to meet, and a lot of that was actually over Zoom, because we just wanted to be safe and uh, respecting um, kind of everybody's needs, uh, but we kind of learned very quickly in that time that was like, oh man, this is good, but we are really missing connection with each other. And so around, I would say it was just after Christmas, so it's been about a year, I guess, that we've been meeting back in person, um, we kind of just came together and said like, okay, look, like, here's what we were doing, which a lot of us were coming and doing our, our GC on Wednesday nights, and then we were going to church and had kids' activities and had um, school and had work, and just lives were so busy. We just said, like, what, what are we actually needing as a group? Like, why are, why are we coming here? We don't want it to be just another thing. We want this to actually be meaningful uh, and enriching for everyone that's coming. And so we kind of landed on a really simple model of the up, in, and out, right, the whole triangle. So we said, if we can just come together every week and we can worship or connect with God, we can have some personal growth, so that inward time, and then we can connect with each other, like we're going to keep wanting this. And so that's what we did. Some weeks we would worship. Um, just the other week, my six-year-old led us in worship of, we drew pictures. And he, he led it. It was so cool. Um, and he, then we talked about why we drew the picture. Um, and other weeks, um, so like I'm not musical, so I rely on my husband to lead worship. But some weeks he's not there, right? So it doesn't always look the same. Um, and we're very flexible as a group and being able to adapt um, and also bring our needs even as leaders. So we'll say, hey, guys, like, we're feeling pretty tired. Um, can someone else take over this week? And people have stepped in and done that over and over again, and we've really tried to build that into our model so that we are doing the whole shared leadership mm -hmm. thing. Um, so it's a place of connection, like I said, the growth part or that inward part for us has happened um, 
we kind of do it in stages. So for a good chunk of time, we spent sharing our stories, kind of like they talked, one of the groups talked about on the video, um, sharing our gospel stories or just our stories in general, if people aren't familiar with the whole gospel story uh, format. Then we've spent time, um, like right now we're in a psalm series, and we're each um, taking a psalm, every single person in their group, um, and we're teaching it to each other. And what we've done over the past, I don't know, several years of meeting is we've tried to just create a safe like environment, a safe space where people feel like they can come and even like mess up and have no idea how to exactly interpret this scripture or this psalm, but at least they can try. And then as a group, we can talk through it and give feedback. So um, I guess it's really been really important for us to build that safety into our group um, because we want people to grow and develop um, as leaders. And if you don't, if you don't create that safe structure, yeah. then they're not wanting to do that. Um, and then from there, like from this, after this psalm, we'll just again ask the group, hey, what are you guys wanting? What are we needing? Uh, and then we kind of pivot and we go from there. So it's a very, um, it's, it's constantly changing, but mm -hmm. we're trying to meet the needs of, of the people that are coming, um, which is also changing. So. Yeah. Why don't you think you guys have needed Sunday gatherings? I think, um, I think the reason that we don't need Sunday gatherings is because Wednesday has become our Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so when we get to connect with God and we get to hear the gospel and we get to connect with each other, I think Sunday just becomes more of a chore mm -hmm. kind of a feeling yeah. for everybody. Yeah, sweet. Um, how has this been better for you than traditional church? Yeah, or... Um, I think how it's been better. Has it been? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes, yeah. very much. Um, and that's not to say like, I love and I value coming here and I love hearing from, from you and from the rest of you that share and lead worship. Like, I think that's so valuable too. Um, so I don't want, I don't want you to feel that I'm saying that I don't value that. Um, but I think, um, when, when we come together and meet in those smaller groups and we actually like have spent, like I said, years together, there's a sort of vulnerability yeah. uh, that gets established where you guys can, like we, have been able to work through some really hard stuff together. And I think that it's hard to do that in a big group gathering. And that's what makes it so worth it. Great. I think that's all I have. Uh, thanks, Rachel. We can, let's clap hands. We do that, right? <clears throat> yeah, I've heard from many people, part of the power of City Church has been you can't hide. Dear. All right. I'm going to, it's going to be okay. Is you, oh, my gosh. Okay. Because you can't hide. And that's a good thing. It may be intimidating. Um, but when you're ready for it, it's, it's life-changing. I want to run by just a couple quick things. What does this look like and what are next steps? I know we're running behind, so I'll try to be as quick as possible. But Kylan, can you pull up the first slide, what this looks like going forward? All right, so what we have been is a collective of, we've said gospel communities. Um, I would call this like a, um, kind of our bigger form of microchurch. Um, these are house church types or... Um, gospel communities is the language we've been using. And these have been um, gatherings of 10 to 30 people. And usually they started off with an organized mission that we gathered around. Uh, but we've, what we've seen is that that's evolved. We had to, we've had to pivot based on life change, life stage changes. So we can go to the next slide now. So now since COVID, since we couldn't meet together and some of our outreach opportunities stopped. We started doing a thing in, in June or July called Outlets. I actually just started doing stuff on my own because I didn't want to sit on my hands. And what we started doing is starting some outlets. And, and I would call these like places where I enjoyed going. So that's why there's a heart. Isn't that cute? And how about my uh, PowerPoint skills, right? Yeah, Google Slides. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm in Cinnamon Ridge, and uh, COVID just drove me nuts because I, I wanted to be a pastor so I could do mission and do outreach and serve. And so we just started doing stuff in rhythm where we love to go and where we wanted to bring Jesus to. And we started saying, hey, what would mission outside of our gospel community look like? So I started doing a monthly uh, worship flow at AMT, doing worship with a workout, because I had loved going to the gym and was experiencing God in the community there, and I wanted to serve the community that had been serving me. And I love music, and I love worship, and I love yoga, and I said, let's do it together. And now we have about 30 to 40 people that are part of the community that we do monthly uh, workouts, several of which are say, have told me, I don't go to church, I wouldn't go to church, this is my church. I don't feel comfortable at a church, um, but I'm comfortable here and I'm connecting with God here. So we're bringing Jesus in those places. B3 is just like that bar micro church he talked about. Um, we started learning about bourbon. I started hanging out with guys that had questions about the Bible, so we called it Bros, Bourbon, and Bible. That's the other P. Uh, that's monthly. Faith and Feminist is a group started by Regina. It was my idea. Um, where we st had ladies connect on um, their values of feminism and reconciling that with their faith. And they formed a, a micro church, an outlet micro church there of people doing. They meet monthly. Evolving Faith, EF, is a group that we're, we're meeting on the third Sunday of every month. And it's this gathering, also this online community where we're constantly having conversations about the things we're deconstructing and helping each other reconstruct our belief system. And it's become a micro church. We have in our group right now, Jordan and Sarah Bruxboard. Jordan runs Naomi Project. And so we see this one starting. The only reason why these hearts are bigger is because I need to fit the words. <laughs> so don't let the shape fool you. Um, this is something that's up and coming, that's happening. And we, we're now in the process of gathering people with him to say, what would starting a new microchurch look like uh, with them? Uh, these other ones have interactions of outreach. Uh, Kaylin Johnson, I uh, put mental health here. That's called Anna's Heart. She has an outlet that I believe is like an online microchurch. I'm sending people, believers and non-believers, to her Facebook group to say, how do I reconcile faith and mental health? I met with a lady this, this week. I'm so blessed by your heart to do that. Um, we have all these other opportunities. West Side, WS means West Side. They have a heart for their neighborhood. They're also praying about what, is, you know, what does mission look like? post-COVID. So this is what we have going on. And I, right now, the way I'm framing this is these are gospel community microchurches, and these are outlet microchurches. It's all microchurches. We're trying to strip down what we see church as, and we're saying, what are the three things church is? It's worship, it's upward connection, it's community, um, it's peer-to-peer -peer connection, and there's some form of passionate way to meet, seek and meet a need in our community. So that's what microchurch is. And these are the opportunities that we have existing. Can you do the next slide, please? We have more, uh, more on the horizon with uh, addiction. John Harmson has a huge heart uh, for the community that struggles with addiction. We have people on the west side that have a heart for single moms. We have uh, the Humphreys have a huge heart for helping people reconstruct their faith after deconstruction. I think that's all of them. But actually, the cool part is, is that we're already doing this, and now we get more time and energy and focus. Uh, to plug in. So for you, you might be wondering, like, what does this look like for me? And there are three things I would suggest. First, in order to, um, if you feel like God was putting a dream on your heart or a call on your heart with, with all the stories you're hearing, um, a big thing that we've recognized is you need a time to be discipled so that you know, like, how to, like, know who you are and then what God's call is on your life. So one thing I would suggest is Join a discipleship huddle. Paige and I, Geneva is going to be starting one. Who else? I have a bunch of people that are finishing right now. We probably have four or five people available to disciple you through a six-month process, of which at the end we're asking you, hey, what's, what's God calling you to do that you love to do, that you bring a certain passion and gift to, and you can start a microchurch and gather some people around what you're excited about. And we bring our faith. We bring our spiritual community, our spiritual connection to the places we're already doing life where we're uh, excited about to serve. Uh, the second thing I would say, join an outlet group. There's plenty, right? Plenty of opportunities. If you want to know what this looks like, if you want to help start one that's already forming, um, a key part of these succeeding is having a core group of people that are with you, that are showing up, bringing their gifts and shared leadership like Rachel sh shared, and helping that thing form. So Join a huddle, join an outlet that's already happening um, if you need more information on those. 
And then join a gospel community, microchurch. Uh, that's going to be a huge support system. I feel like that's a big reason why uh, the Bruxfords are, are thinking about starting their own is because they've been in ours for six months. They've seen some rhythms. They've experienced some support. And now they can see themselves doing it. Um, I'm speaking for him, but I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what I've, what I've gotten from them. So join a huddle. Get discipled. Naturally, when you're discipled, you're going you're gonna to start dreaming dreams and get, getting healthy. Join an outlet so you can see what this looks like. You can bring your gifts to what's already going on and join a gospel community that's existing. If you need any information on that, please contact us. I'll be out here. Page is available. When things are meeting, what time they're at, who's going to be there. That's, that's our vision going forward, and that's your place in it. There's a lot more we could talk about, but the rest of the time, if you're, if you're here, if you want to hang out, um, I would suggest you just talk to each other and you share, if, if you're going to hang out, share like what ideas did you have? What community groups did you envision helping start or need?